In the middle of the 18th century, Britons made their living by one means above all, farming. Most people spent their working days on the land, as they always had done. However, it was about to undergo the most profound social change in its history, a change that would affect and define us all. In the space of just 60 years, Britain would experience a revolution. A revolution which would take the worker out of the country and into the city, out of a rural economy and into urban factories. This is the story of the machines and people that, for better or worse, created our modern world of work. Fifty years ago, Georgian farmers were already changing the face of the landscape. They'd had to. Britain's population was booming, so marsh, wasteland and woods were drained, cleared and put under the plough. For the first time, farmers, utilising innovations in agriculture, were able to produce enough food to allow this ever-increasing population to flourish. And increase the population did mightily. In 1750 in England, there were five and a half million people living. In 1850, the population had increased to over 16 and a half million. Absolutely amazing. With such a growth of crops and people, the old established technologies could no longer cope. Flour millers in particular wanted to improve their most important machine, the water wheel. In New since Roman times, the water wheel was still the main source of power, but was at the center of an increasingly heated debate. There were two basic designs, the undershot and the overshot. Some contested that the undershot was six times more efficient than the overshot. Others insisted that the overshot was ten times better. In 1752, a maker of scientific instruments, John Smeaton, was foolhardy enough to try and settle the matter with science. At the age of 27, Smeaton was given a commission to build a water mill, a feat itself since he'd never built one before. To work out which design he would use in his mill commission, Smeaton built a sophisticated wooden model. It allowed him to test how much power the undershot and the overshot wheel exerted in the same wooden frame using the same head of water. I'm now going to have a go at this groundbreaking experiment. This one, of course, here's the undershot, and this is how it works. I open the reservoir, water comes out, and it gushes below the wheel, and it turns to paddles. Now, here's the overshot. Same thing, open the sluice, and the water gushes out of here, I should say, at the same rate of knots as out of that. The water power is the same for both wheels. What's interesting is the turn in different directions. So, which is the stronger? Well, we'll have a tug of war to find out. We can do this by connecting the two wheels with this rod here. And of course, the stronger wheel will prevail and will drag the weaker wheel in its direction. Let the battle commence. The overshot is going the direction it should be going and it's dragging the undershot with it. Quite clearly, the overshot wheel is the more powerful. There it is, the winner. <laughs> Smeaton showed with his experiment that the overshot is approximately twice as efficient as the undershot. The key is gravity. The energy of the overshot is greater because it's falling from a height. Not one to rush to hasty conclusions, Smeaton took six years to publish his findings. The detail of his analysis has left me a little baffled, but it amazed his peers. 
With his scientific test and analysis of the result, Smeaton offered a way to focus on the efficiency of machines that others could follow. Smeaton had really laid the foundations for the modern profession of civil engineering. In the hands of another man, Richard Arkwright, the work revolution would take its next crucial step. Arkwright had a brand new machine powered by Smeaton's overshot water wheel. It was hidden away in a remote valley of the Pennines in Derbyshire, as if in a fortress. He didn't want anyone to see what he had in there. Arkwright's secret machine would transform the manufacture of a traditional cottage industry unchanged for generations. Cotton spinning. To produce cotton thread in the mid 18th century, raw cotton was spun on the traditional spinning wheel. The spinner first drew out the cotton fibers and at the same time locked them together with a twist introduced at the spindle's end. Then, the drawn-out thread was wound back onto the spindle. It was a hugely skilled but time-consuming labor-intensive business and produced only a very weak thread. Arkwright's machine would change all this. Textile historian Anna Benson can tell us how. And now, Anna, over here is something quite different, a machine that revolutionized the uh, production of thread. Arkwright's water frame. Wonderful thing. And I came to tell me how the water frame works. I mean, I can see up here, this is rather like the raw cotton you had in your hand over there, isn't it? On this machine, yeah. all the processes I've been doing on the great wheel are being done at the same time. Right. So we bring in this cotton at the back here, yeah. and these rollers, they're geared to go yeah. at separate speeds. The back one is going slower than the front one, and that bit that I was doing with my fingers on the great wheel is being done here, it's oh. drafting the fibres out so that it's going thinner. OK, now I can actually get this in operation so we can see just what you mean. Get the wheel going, get my rhythm going. I can engage the mechanism like this and oh. off we go. So it's fantastic, mm. it's all, all happening at once. Being drawn out, spun and wound on. Earlier in the century, drafting rollers had been patented, mm. but it was Arkwright's genius to realize the system and to make these drafting rollers work. So obviously it's making um, more thread more quickly, but also, as I understand it, the quality is better. In fact, it was so good and so easy to produce that Arkwright was able to think big. But imagine not just four bobbins loaded with thread, but 96 and powered not by hand, but by water wheel. And indeed, not just 96, but row upon row of these machines, floor upon floor. Such a dream entailed an altogether new kind of building. It was the cathedral of the Industrial Revolution, the factory. Arkwright's prototype cotton spinning mills were the first of their kind in the world and pioneered the factory system. A system in search of a workforce. Cromford Mill needed more labor than could be found locally. So Arkwright advertised for workers to come from further afield. But he was looking for a particular kind of worker. Because the water frame had turned a skilled operation into simple child's play, Arkwright needed mainly unskilled labor. He advertised for families so that he could staff his mill cheaply with women and children. To accommodate them, the first mill town grew up around the mill. Arkwright set up a church, a pub, a market, and even a school. But perhaps the greatest incentive to attract families to come from other areas was the state-of-the-art housing. During the 1770s, Arkwright built these houses in North Street for um, his workforce. They are really pretty amazing. By the standards of the time for working class housing, this is really something very special indeed. The people who would have lived here, the um, urban or rural poor, paupers indeed included, would have been really amazed by this palatial accommodation. It would have been a big incentive to work at the mill. 
and work they did, by day and by night. Indeed, Arkwright's employees would find that the whole pattern of life was changed by the way they had to work in the mill. To make a return on his investment, Arkwright ran his Cromford factory as a 24-hour operation. And so he gave us shift work. Time was now money. This was a highly productive, a somewhat alarming place. The workforce toiled long and fixed hours, enforced by the threat of punishments and fines. Exhausted children toiled 13-hour shifts, day and night, six days a week. The machine dictated the pace of life. And this was the price the employees paid for a small yet secure wage. Their employer, Arkwright, on the other hand, made his fortune. He licensed his patent for the water frame technology to others, but only in units of 1,000 spindles, so that anyone wanting to use the machine had to set up a factory too. Within 18 years of establishing Cromford, there were over 140 water frame mills spread all over the country. But the factory was still far from reaching its full potential. Only one thing could unlock that. Steam. It all began with a kettle. James Watts' aunt was angry. Rather than reading a good book, the 15-year-old sat around the house all day just watching the kettle boil. He'd lift the lid, look inside, see the steam rising, see the steam condensing on the inside of the lid. Now, what the aunt took as um, idleness was really the keen attention of a junior scientist, a man who would, one day, invent the world's first really efficient steam engine. James Watt grew up to be a maker of scientific instruments at Glasgow University. One day, he was asked to repair a model of an early steam engine, the Newcomen engine. The model had literally run out of steam. The Newcomen engine had been in use since the beginning of the 18th century. It was mainly used for pumping water out of mines, but didn't work terribly well. The engine operated on the principle of a vacuum, created by condensing steam in a single cylinder. However, it consumed a huge amount of coal to produce not a lot of power. Now, the problem with this engine is that steam had to be injected and condensed in the same cylinder. This means that for every stroke of the piston, the cylinder had to be heated and cooled, heated and cooled, heated and cooled. This made the machine um, very, very inefficient indeed. Watt fixed the model, but wrestled with the problem of its inefficiency for over a year. Then he went for a walk on a Glasgow golf course. In 1765, as he walked across Glasgow Green, inspiration struck. As he was to write, I'd walked no further than the golf house before I had the whole thing arranged in my mind. Good shot, sir. This is Crofton Pumping Station. It provides water for the Kennet and Avon Canal. Inside the station is the oldest steam engine in the world still doing its original job. And it was built by Watt. In the new Newcomer engine, steam was injected and condensed in the same cylinder, making it really not very efficient. This is where Watt had a simple, ingenious idea, a real leap forward. In his engine, the cooling process was separated from the cylinder. And here we have his condenser down here. A wonderful thing. Which means that the cylinder upstairs remains hot all the time. Steam from the boiler enters the cylinder at the top, pushing down the piston inside. At the end of the stroke, the pressure in the cylinder is equalised and the natural weight of the pump rod pulls the piston up towards its starting position. As it rises, a valve releases the steam into the bottom of the cylinder. On each downward stroke, this steam is drawn into the separate condenser, where it is condensed. This process creates a vacuum which pulls down the piston as the steam above pushes it down. 
This amazingly efficient use of steam means that the Watt engine consumes less than a third of the amount of coal used by the Newcomen engine. It's also twice as powerful. The awesome power of this engine raised the tonne of water with every stroke. That's nearly four million gallons a day. But Watt's engine was to become more than just an efficient super pump, was to drive the transformation of every workplace in the country. But there was a problem. Watt was a, a pessimist, a hypochondriac, prone to fits of despair, inactivity and depression. His low point came in 1773, when he concluded that there was nothing more foolish than inventing. And for once, his depression was justified because after eight years of toil on his steam engine, his partner went bankrupt. What he needed, of course, was a new partner, one with drive, resourcefulness, and a head for business. Enter Matthew Bolton. Bolton was a dynamic Birmingham manufacturer who, when he met Watt, saw the designs for the steam engine and immediately realised its potential as a business venture. Bolton, with his ready cash, his craftsman and his confidence, took on this great and new idea and he ran with it. Watt left Scotland and joined Bolton in Birmingham in 1774. In partnership, these two men were going to be, as you'll see, giants of the Industrial Revolution. Within five years, after improving their prototypes, they had captured the market in steam engines for pumping water out of tin, copper and lead mines. But Bolton had bigger ambitions. Bolton realised that one small but highly significant alteration to the steam engine would make it much, much more useful. He urged Watt to devise a way of converting the up and down or reciprocating action of the engine into rotary action. So it worked rather like a super efficient, powerful and very reliable water wheel. With an arm attached to a crankshaft driving a system of belts, the steam engine could power not just one machine at a time, but a whole series of them. Steam power was about to change work and the workplace, not just for the miner, but for the manufacturer, the iron foundry worker, the textile worker, the distiller, and even the potter. Steam was now big business, and the place it took off from was the Industrial Revolution's most happening city, Birmingham. Even today, over 200 years after they met, you can still come across Bolton and Watt. I wonder if, when their partnership began, they realised they would create one of the first international corporate businesses with not only factory but design, marketing and office workers too. But success brought with it mountains of paperwork. At Bolton's home, Soho House, still standing today, Watt showed his business partner how he could improve the speed and efficiency of their office clerks. The lugubrious Watt created the forerunner of a key office tool we can't imagine doing without today, the photocopier. This amazing thing is it, one of Watt's copiers. Now, the ink was very important. How do you use special ink? Ink mixed with sugar and uh, a good dash of French brandy. OK, now I transform what looks like a uh, travelling writing desk into a printing press. Amazing. Well, now I'll make a copy of my letter. What instructs as follows. Cover the letter written with its special ink with a carefully dampened sheet of copying paper and place them both between two pieces of card. Then attach a handle to the roller, insert the letter sandwich into the pasteboard and finally roll it all through the press twice. Let's see. Gosh, amazing. A copy, not crystal clear perhaps, but then maybe I didn't get the ink quite right or the paper the right sort of dampness. But nevertheless, 
a very, very good copy, and, uh, well, there we are, Mr. Watts done it, invented the world's first copying machine. The letter copying press was just one bestseller. Bolton's Birmingham manufactory was an established producer of a wide variety of goods. Their unique selling point was their superb, consistent quality. Amazingly beautiful silverware, buckles, medals, jewellery, and above all, buttons. Even the king and queen were customers, and with Georgian Britons all over the country following the fashion, demand for them was high. To meet that demand, Bolton had to realise the full potential of a new management technique, the division of labour. The workforce was about to meet the production line. Bolton's genius was in breaking down the steps of production. A visitor to his manufactory noticed how, instead of employing a single hand to produce one button, skilled and unskilled workers took on different parts of the process be it rolling, stamping, cutting, engraving, or gilding. It seems obvious today, but this was a revolutionary idea in the mid-18th century. The most famous economist of his day, Adam Smith, described in his work, The Wealth of Nations, how the production of a pin was industrialized by the division of labor. Adam Smith noted that the manufacture of a humble pin can be divided into 18 distinct stages of various difficulty and complexity. For example, the uh, drawing of the wire, the straightening the wire, the cutting the wire, adding the uh, pin head, pretty complicated, I'm sure, tiny little thing, and then, of course, sharpening the pin. Now, Smith noted that if um, 10 people are involved in the production of the pin, each responsible for a different stage of the manufacture, then in a day, 48,000 pins could be made. On average, 4,800 pins per person. On the other hand, if just one person attempted to make a pin, undertaking all 18 different stages, then they'd be lucky to make 20 pins a day. More, better, and for less effort and cost. This was management consultancy, 18th century style. This button factory in Birmingham, which dates in origin from Bolton's time, is still going strong. Here we can see that if each stage is undertaken by a different hand, that is still the most economic way of producing the goods. With steam power and organized manpower driving it, the Industrial Revolution was unstoppable. At the start of the 19th century, mining, engineering and manufacturing were all literally steaming ahead, leaving the old agricultural economy behind. With steam power at their disposal, employers were no longer restricted to water power provided by remote rural rivers. They could be anywhere, and factory upon factory now sprang up in new industrial cities. This was progress, but for many, it had a dark, satanic face. Industrialization happened with very little control from the government. Industrialists, the employers, could, in their search for vast profits, do pretty much as they liked. There were no effective laws to protect the rights of the workers until the 1840s, and unions, well, they were pretty well non-existent. The boss had the worker very much at his mercy, and no one was more vulnerable than the weaver. More than any other worker, the weaver experienced the glory and the misery of industrial progress. At the start of the Industrial Revolution, mechanization had made him rich. The spinning machines had made cotton cut price and kept the weaver in constant employment as he busily tried to satisfy the demand for new cheap clothes. Now, mechanization had caught up with his craft. The new automatic power looms, driven by steam, would make the weaver redundant. Operated by unskilled attendants, the power looms were able to do the intricate work of the weaver much more quickly and cheaply. 
he simply couldn't compete. Employers used the competition from power looms to drive down weavers' wages. And weavers, faced with dwindling prospects of employment, had to take any job they could get, no matter how low the wages, anything to keep body and soul together. Now, faced with no support from the government, the weavers had to take direct action. In the 1820s, industrial action broke out all over Britain's new textile districts. But the protest was in vain. Britain's weavers, facing starvation, would literally die out. 250,000 of them. One loom in particular would not just revolutionise the weaver's world, but would set in motion today's technological revolution, the Jacquard loom. A Frenchman, Joseph-Marie Jacquard, invented his loom in 1801 to weave fashionable patterned fabrics. The ingenious thing was that the patterns could be woven automatically. A pattern is built up by passing the weft, a coloured thread which runs across the loom through a space between the taut warp threads which run from the front of the loom to the back. The pattern which emerges depends on whether the weft passes above the warp threads or below them. To allow this, some warp threads are lifted while others stay in place. I've come to Paradise Mill in Macclesfield to find out more from a weaver, Sarah Lees. How does the, the loom know which warp threads to lift, which to leave in place, and in which order? Ah, well, that's all controlled by the jacquard on top, um, and it's punch cards which tell it which ones you want to leave or pick up. I can see it's lots of cards, hundreds of cards with thousands of holes, but I can't quite make out from here how it works. Can you give me more detail? I've got a model to show you, which will make it all clearer. Oh, if you want to go and excellent. have a look. Can we see that yet? Yeah, please. certainly. <laughs> It all depends on these cards here. These cards are presented to these spring-loaded needles. Can I have a touch yeah, of those? Certainly. Oh, yes, certainly. rather sharp. OK, here they are, the needles here, and those go into yep. the holes. Yep, and those are in turn are presented to these hooks. What I'm saying, these hooks control the warp threads down below. So um, if there's a hole in the card, um, the needle passes through it, and the hook is left over the beam, which lifts up. So if there's a hole, the warp thread would be lifted. Whereas if there's a solid, the hook is pushed off the beam, the warp thread stays down. I mean, if I treadle it, you can see different ones picked up every time. Incredible. So these cards are basically the code for the pattern on the fabric. Yes. It seems to be very, very, very pioneering. Mm, it was. It not only controlled um, the jacquard, but later on it is, has led to the first computer programming. So, the same binary code principles used to program the jacquard loom holes and blanks in a piece of card were later applied to programming the first computers. So, in a sense, one could say the modern world of information technology started here with the Jacquard loom. Many key features of our working life today, the centralised corporation, shift working, the production line, the photocopier, even the computer. These all started during the Industrial Revolution. You can obtain a free poster map of Industrial Revolution sites and events, plus details of all open university programmes by calling 0870 900 0352 or visit the website at bbc.co.uk forward slash history. Next week, On the Move. <laughs>